Um, this is what the state capitol building at, in Madison, Wisconsin looked like on February 19th, uh, 2011, two days after the, well, three days really after the protest began, two days after the heart of the protest began. And this is what it looked like more or less for 17 days. This is the longest occupation of a government building in American history. It occurred in Madison, Wisconsin this year, and nobody would have expected it. If uh, I had been asked about the possible forms of political protest in Madison a few weeks before this happened, I would not have thought that this level of intensity sustained over this length of time would have been possible. Now, of course, that it actually happened <clears throat> is a combination of some underlying structural features, uh, an accumulation of frustration and anger, plus some very special historical circumstances that made such an event possible. What I'd like to do uh, in, um, hopefully, in, in about 25 minutes of time is tell you the story, tell you how it came to pass that we had this happen, um, show you a bunch of uh, pictures to go along with the story, so you'll get a flavor of what it was like. And then um, about a 10 minute set of video clips that I took. I took the video clips, of course, uh, well maybe not of course, but in fact, not with any expectation of showing them at a lecture, certainly not in Berlin. If I had had the anticipation that what I was going to do was speak about the protest in Madison, I would have done a much more systematic job than I actually did. So you'll have to have a certain flexibility again in, uh, in watching the videos, though I think you'll find them interesting. So here's the basic short version of the story. In November of 2010, there was an off-year election, meaning a, 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 in the election cycle when, the, when it's not a presidential election, uh, in which <clears throat> In the state of Wisconsin, the governorship, the state assembly, and half of the seats in the state senate were up for election. Prior to this last election, all three of these bodies were in Democratic Party control. And the Democratic Party of Wisconsin is a relatively progressive Democratic Party. It's uh, more on the left end of the spectrum of possible Democratic parties in the US. All three uh, elections resulted in Republican victories. Republicans gained a majority in the assembly, a majority in the Senate, and they gained the governorship as well. And furthermore, the Democrats lost one of the most progressive voices in the Senate when Senator Feingold from Wisconsin was defeated in the Senate election. It was a major defeat for <clears throat> what passes as the left of the Democratic Party in the United States, in the state of Wisconsin. The governor, Scott Walker, from Milwaukee, ran as a conservative Republican, but not an extremist. There was no expectation that this was a calamity. The expectation was, in the tradition of Wisconsin, that this was the normal kind of unfortunate oscillation between Democrats and Republicans. Wisconsin is a fairly evenly balanced state, and in my years in Wisconsin, the 35 years I've lived there, there have been four or five occasions when parties have changed like this. So there was an expectation that this was unfortunate, but it was not seen as some major dividing point, as a real change in the character of state politics. On January 4th, uh, the governor was inaugurated and immediately called a special session of the legislature. The legislature wouldn't normally have met <clears throat> Uh, for an extended period at that particular time. And the first thing he did was pass a series of tax cuts for corporations and businesses. Uh, prior to the tax cuts, uh, the Fiscal Bureau of the state of Wisconsin projected a fiscal surplus in the state of about $130 million for this fiscal cycle. After the tax cuts, there was a $100 million projected deficit. States in the United States are not legally allowed to run deficits, and so the governor introduced what is called a budget repair bill, an emergency piece of legislation to cut spending because we can't run a deficit. 
The spending cuts he proposed were significant, but of the sort that you would expect. But in addition to the spending cuts, he introduced a series of provisions that in effect would destroy public sector unions. Not damage them, destroy them. The provisions in this bill would have made uh, a requirement of a public sector union that every single year they have a certification election. So every year they have to have a vote of the membership as to whether they, the membership is going to continue supporting the union. Secondly, the unions were not allowed to have the dues for the union deducted from paychecks. The members of the union had to individually pay every month the uh, dues to the union. Third, the unions were not allowed to be involved in grievance procedures. And fourth, they could only bargain on wages up to the rate of inflation and nothing else. Now, if those are the rules of the game for public sector unions, how many years will those unions last? I think they could have survived a period. There would have been enough mobilization to keep them going, but obviously this was a very serious attack on unions. Put in the form of a budget repair bill, an emergency piece of a legislation. That bill was introduced uh, to the state legislature on February 14th. On February 15th, the state assembly started holding hearings, public hearings on the, uh, on the bill. <clears throat> After 17 hours of hearings, the Republicans in the state assembly said enough, we're done with the hearings and they walked out. But there were still people waiting to testify, including members of the University of Wisconsin Teaching Assistance Association, the union representing graduate student uh, teaching assistants. They were in the hearing room and they stood up and said, let us be heard, let us be heard. And the Assembly Democrats said, fine, let's continue the uh, hearings into the night as long as there are people present to testify. The TAA, Teaching Assistant Association, then went out and mobilized lots of other people to come to the state capitol to testify. And so it pa happened that that first night, the building was remained open. And people didn't think they were occupying the building, but in effect, that's what happened. The first night, several hundred people stayed overnight. The rules of the state government at Wisconsin require that the state capitol building be open to the public so long as there is a public meeting. And a hearing is a public meeting. You will see in the video clips a chant which goes, keep the cameras rolling, keep the meeting open. Keep the meeting going. Keep the cameras rolling, keep the meeting going. Well, that was a chant to keep these hearings going on indefinitely. The longer the hearings go on, the longer the delay in the uh, vote for the bill. Okay, so that happens the first night. Uh, two other things happen which then make this big news. Uh, the most heartwarming, but not the most important, was that a local pizza parlor, Ian's Pizzas, at two o'clock in the morning when they closed, they're about 200 meters from the state capitol building. Uh, they packaged up all their leftover pizza and took it to the students and the Democratic assemblymen who were in the state capitol building and fed them with their leftover pizza. National Public Radio picked that up as a news item the next day. And it suddenly became, you know, a very, <clears throat> one of these human interest stories. By the end of the protests, Ian's pizzas had received orders for pizzas to be delivered to the state capitol from 52 countries <laughs> and every state in the United States. They stopped completely selling pizzas to the general public. You could not go into the store and buy a pizza because they were producing 24 hours a day pizzas for the state capitol building. Uh, as a, now this is a problem, you see, I, I have so many stories to tell about this. This is going to interfere with our serious discussions of real utopias. Nevertheless, after the dust settled and the protests were over, there was an event at the university that I was hosting a reception and a lot of my graduate students were coming to this reception. And I had to organize food for it and I suggested I order pizza. And they looked at me in horror and said they never wanted to see pizza again in their life. Uh, they lived on pizza for 
a couple of weeks in the state capitol building. Uh, so that was one of the things that happened. The other thing that happened is that the Madison School Teachers Union uh, declared a sick out. That is, three quarters of the teachers reported illness. Uh, and the city school board, the Madison School Board, agreed to basically close the schools for four days. And they provided uh, child care at the schools for parents that needed their kids to be at school, but the schools were pretty much officially closed for four days. The teachers from the two high schools that are closest to the state, state capitol building, each are about two kilometers from the state capitol building, then marched from, this is February, Wisconsin. You know, we're, we're talking serious winter here. Uh, probably minus 10 or 15 degrees. Uh, they marched from their high schools to the state capitol with hundreds and hundreds of high school students along with them arriving at the state capitol after this night of testimony. These high school students came in. They saw what a scene this was, how exciting this event was, and they started testifying on behalf of their teachers, and the teachers started testifying. And soon, the wait to testify grew to two, three, four hours. You would sign up, get a time that you should come back, and then you'd have to wait in the hearing room for two hours while 40 people ahead of you testified. Uh, by the second night, or the, I suppose by the third night, it looked like this. Uh, then what happened was the following. The Republicans in the State Assembly met and voted on the bill uh, while the hearings were still going on. They voted on the bill. The procedure would then be that the bill would go from the State Assembly to the State Senate. Now, there's a special rule at, in Wisconsin that for a budget bill, the State Senate needs a quorum of 20 members. 20 members for a quorum. There were 19 Republicans and 14 Democrats in the State Senate. The 14 Democrats then fled the state and went into hiding in Illinois the state immediately to the south. The Wisconsin state troopers could not cross state borders to drag the uh, state senators back to, to the state senate. And so the bill was hung up in the senate with these 14 Wisconsin Democrat sem senators hiding out in Rockford, Illinois, a city just to the south of the Wisconsin border. That then sparked a major intensification of the whole set of protests. And that's really when this level of intensity occurred for the next uh, two weeks. Uh, I'll now just run through a bunch of pictures relatively quickly, commenting on some of, some of this. You can see uh, how colorful. The, the red shirts are the University of Wisconsin um, colors are red and white. Uh, Let's see, I want to, so I can tell you what some of these things are. Um, the uh, state motto of Wisconsin is four words. And so there were lots of signs of the form Wisconsin forward, not backward. I went to Iraq and came home to Egypt. This was occurring at the same time as the Egyptian demonstrations. There was a photograph that was on the web of somebody holding a large protest sign in Tahir Square, saying the people of Egypt support the people of Wisconsin, one world, one pain. Uh, it just uh, moved people in the Wisconsin protest to tears to feel that sense of connection over such distances. The uh, protests were marked by an extraordinary production of, of homemade signs and uh, folk art. Uh, this one I especially like democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for lunch. Liberty is a well-armed sheep contesting the vote. Apparently, Benjamin Franklin said that. I'll just run through most of these fairly quickly. Five states in the United States specifically prohibit collective bargaining for teachers. Their rankings in the combined ACT, SAT scores, those are the university admissions tests, 
are as follows, 44th Virginia, 47th Texas, 48th Georgia, 49th North Carolina, and 50th South Carolina. Wisconsin, Wisconsin is currently tied for second. And the Walker bill would abolish collective bargaining for teachers. Uh, these are boxes from Ian's Pizza. Mom, my new address is the capital. <laughs> Labor precedes capital, a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Um, notice that all of the signs have blue tape on the walls. The, the blue masking tape doesn't mark the walls. There was a tremendous effort on the part of the protesters to avoid damage to the building, to uh, clean up every night, to help the, the janitorial staff, a uh, very strict prohibition against graffiti. Whenever anybody began to do graffiti, they got totally, um, you know, attacked, not physically, but berated by, uh, by the core of the people involved in the protests. Bob La Follette is a famous early 20th century a uh, progressive politician in Wisconsin, one of the founders of the Progressive Party, a, a very important figure in the first decades of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, the, the question, and there's a statue of him in the state capitol building. The what would Bob do question is a kind of joke because there is a bumper sticker that you see a lot in certain parts of the United States WWJD, what would Jesus do? Uh, typically, the conservative Christian right has WWJD as, a, as their kind of slogan. Uh, what would Bob do is what would Bob LaFollette do in this context? People slept over. They had little nests which they built around the state capitol building. They left their stuff there all day long, and as far as I know, there was no problem of of theft. I heard of no incident of anybody losing any of their stuff while they were camping out. This is the, um, what came to be known as the Teaching Assistance Association Situation Room. This, the Assembly Democrats gave this meeting room to the teaching assistants, who then proceeded to be the core of the organizing committee for what happened inside of the walls of the Capitol building. They set up a medical center, food stations in various places, an information center, and a child care center, with, which was staffed by child care workers with toys and other things to amuse small children so that parents could bring their kids to the rallies and leave their kids in this protected child care space um, during, while they were away. The uh, teaching assistants also organized marshals, that is, they kind of deputized people with uh, armbands to walk around and just be sure that everything was calm and to try to enforce the norms about not trashing the building and using the blue tape. And they ran seminars on peaceful protest so that when confrontations with the Tea Party occurred, which happened uh, into the protest, when Tea Party supporters came to try to disrupt things, people would know how to respond to it. The Madison Police Department uh, made a very big public relations deal of praising the protesters and the occupants of the building for managing the protests in such a civil manner. And indeed, firefighters and policemen joined the protests. This was, for me, his, you know, I've been involved in protests and demonstrations my whole life. This was really quite an extraordinary moment to have firefighters marching with signs saying, firefighters for labor. The state, uh, the governor, when he passed this legislation, when he proposed this legislation, excluded firemen, policemen, and state troopers from the legislation. Those unions could continue. Those were the three unions that supported him in the, in the election. The leadership of those three unions publicly apologized for having supported uh, the Republican Party uh, and, and said it was outrageous that the governor was trying to divide labor through this tactic, and therefore, police, firemen, and, well, not so much the state troopers, but the police and firemen, when they were off duty, joined in the protests. When it finally came to pass that uh, the governor did force people out of the building, you know, basically drag them out, um, nobody was arrested. The police re refused to arrest anybody. They did physically remove people, but they refused to arrest anyone. 
for the occupation, even when people resisted being taken out of the building. Um, more pictures of the TAA testify, testify. This was the key. This is what enabled the building to stay open, was the testimony. Um, and I'd, I'd like to just share with you a personal story about the testimony. I did not initially plan to testify, not as a decision. It was just a kind of non-decision. I hadn't ever testified in this kind of public hearing at a, in the state legislature. And it wasn't in my awareness as something that I did. Uh, the graduate students were very active in recruiting people to testify. They would roam the halls of the state capitol and say, have you testified, have you testified? And if you said no, they would grab you and say, you've got to testify. So I, in due course, got grabbed by a graduate student in sociology, taken to the hearing room, and without resistance, I was happy to do so, signed up, got my date card, my time card, so I'd know when to return. And uh, an hour later went into the hearing room to wait the two hours it would take while the 40 people or so ahead of me did their testimony. Now I went thinking, okay, this is just something I'm gonna do because I was asked to do it. I'm doing my bit for the struggle. I had no anticipation that this would be an incredibly powerful experience for me personally. Uh, you know, I'm in my 60s. I don't expect to have experiences that I can describe as affecting my identity, that actually impact how I think of myself in the world. Uh, and that's what happened in that hearing. I've lived in Wisconsin for 35 years. I love it. I think it's a wonderful place. But I had always thought of it as my base of operations. It's where I lived. And then I went off in the world and did my thing, right? I saw myself as a global intellectual, as a left intellectual. If I ever use the word citizen, it's hardly in my vocabulary to think of myself in that way. I would say glibly, I'm a citizen of the world, right? That would be my self-concept. Um, I did my civic d duties. I've been on jury duty. I vote in elections. But it was not because of some deep part of my sense of who I am and where I am. It was because of, that's what a responsible person does. Uh, and I certainly would never have given my self-definition a citizen of Wisconsin. It just wasn't a way that I would have framed how I was in the world. And there I was in this room with 40 other people telling their stories. Um, how this bill would affect their lives, some in tragic ways. There was a mother whose son was autistic and had just gotten into what's called Badger Care, which is a special program of supplementary medical support for people who don't qualify for Medicaid, which is health care for the poor. They, they earn too much for Medicaid, but they have extraordinary medical needs and therefore they qualify for what's called badger care. Badgers, that's the symbol of Wisconsin, the badger. Uh, and she was saying how fantastically well her son was doing and how the cuts in the budget would eliminate badger care and what a tragedy this would be. So people told their stories. And I felt part of a community of fellow citizens, in the strong sense, citizens, members of a polity, standing up, to be heard and to influence public discourse around an issue. Uh, it was very important for me in that respect. Most of the people who went to the um, hearings, I think for them, the salient feature was a chance to be heard. For me, it was a chance to listen. And in a way that I would not have listened if I had merely been watching. It was different from being a spectator. We've seen hearings. I've seen them on television. I've occasionally been at a public hearing of one sort or another. Uh, it was totally different to be in the queue with these other people, being just one among them in the context of this. Um, so for what it's worth, uh, the experience of that form of participation really impacted me and changed the way I thought of my subsequent participation in this event. Now, I don't want to extrapolate from that in saying that this was some you know, phenomenally deep identity transformation of the hundreds of thousands, there were several hundred thousand of people altogether who participated in these events. 
I think some of them were deeply moved and changed by it, others not. For me, it was certainly powerful. Testify is what was plastered on the wall. Uh, more just uh, signs, pictures from the demonstrations. This is what the uh, state capitol looks like. There's a street that runs between the university on one hill and the state capitol on another hill. The street is called State Street. And uh, the, the standard route for demonstrations in Madison is from the university campus to the state capitol. Fighter fighters for laborers, fire fighters for workers' rights. Even I look less ridiculous than Scott Watcher, than Scott Walker. This is February. I mean, this is way below freezing. <laughs> Animals for the ethical treatment of people. <laughs> Screw us and we multiply. Now you've pissed off grandma. <laughs> Wisconsin. Notice the association of the middle class with unions. That's a typical way that union members describe the importance of, the, of unions. The unions create the middle class in the American lingo for how to think about this. Uh, the last day of the protests included a tractorcade of 70 tractors going around the state capitol, farmers supporting labor. Storm the Bastille. Open for business, come exploit our labor and our natural resources. Family farmers support children's teachers. Wisconsin, open for exploitation. The governor had a sign in his office, Wisconsin, now open for business after he was elected. I would like to linger in, on more of these. Um, the state of Wisconsin looks like an open hand. The old state shape, that's pretty much what the state looks like in its shape. <laughs> uh, ballerinas for fairness. Jesus was a carpenter, Pontius Pilate was a governor. <laughs> Union thug in training. Scott Walker referred to the union activists involved in this, these protests as union thugs. And now the, um, Sound, we need the sound on. Now think of this as so loud that you can't hear a person next to you speaking to you. The flag in that, um, in this shot, is the United Farm Workers flag.
and think of this happening every day for two weeks. It was continuous from mid-afternoon until 10 or 11 at night. They created a norm that around 10 at night they would calm down so the people who were sleeping over could get to sleep. Scott Walker was a university dropout. He never finished his undergraduate degree. Firefighters in the United States have a tradition of having a bagpipe pour as part of the firefighters' um, association, I think, to play bagpipes at funerals. So every afternoon, the firefighters would gather on a side street near the state capitol, march around the capitol building with their bagpipes, march through the capitol building, and then out into the rally that was taking place every afternoon. And the police would also join in with the firefighters behind them. People would shout, thank you, thank you. I, I wasn't, I have to say, t so uh, enthusiastic about this constant thank you to the police and firemen. They were just doing what they ought to do, but still, the appreciation, I think, helped build a sense of commonality. see what a fantastically beautiful building this is. It's really a stunning state capitol. If any of you come to Wisconsin, you must go inside of this building. And for uh, those of us in Wisconsin to have solidarity forever, 
sung inside the state capitol late at night after 10 days or so of the protests was itself a moving and powerful experience. The blue fist is in the shape of the state of Wisconsin. The reason why the fist is blue rather than the fist being red is because the color coding of political parties in the United States is that the Democrats are blue and the Republicans are red. Um, the television networks decided on that color coding of the parties on the because if they had coded the Democrats as red, it would have been viewed as uh, a political statement. Whereas just having the Republicans being red and the Democrats blue were just two different colors. So when you hear uh, political commentaries talk about red states and blue states in the United States, the red states are the conservative states and the blue states are the more progressive states. Purple states are the states that are evenly balanced between reds and blues. Wisconsin is now called a purple state because it does oscillate. The, um, the tractors in the tractor cade are old tractors. These farmers have modern tractors as well, but when they do this kind of thing, they take out their antiques. Well, that's it for my Wisconsin story.